clock is ticking for all three major U.S. automakers to reach a new labor contract and to avoid a strike that could cost the U.S. economy billions of dollars. Ford, GM, and Stellantis have until midnight to reach an agreement or face walkouts by thousands in the United Auto Workers Union. Employees of those companies are demanding a pay raise and better benefits. Let's bring in former Treasury official and Morning Joe economic analyst Steve Ratner. He is at the Southwest Wall with his charts. Before we dive in, Steve, what's your sense as the former car czar in the Obama administration of how this thing ends? Is this going to go on for a while? Yeah, uh, Willie, really, this looks like one of the toughest ones we've seen in a very long time. Uh, the UAW has new leadership, uh, very, very aggressive, saying very, very aggressive things. The demands are uh, incredibly substantial, much more than the car companies can do. And I think at 11.59 tonight, you'll see some strikes. He's come up with a fairly clever strategy of striking only a few plants to start with, which would have the effect of still disrupting car production, the goal, of course, but also not have most of the workers out on strike where they have to receive strike benefits from the union. They would continue to get paid by the companies. Mm -hmm. So it could be a kind of an unusual strike, but nonetheless, uh, potentially crippling to the auto industry. Yeah, just hours left to go here before a potential strike. So let's dig into your charts with all that in the background, Steve. Your first chart is about labor scoring some recent wins in these strikes. Yeah, Willie, I wanted to give you a sense of what's going on in the labor uh, world in general. And so these are days lost to work stoppages. Uh, each day a workers on strike counts as one. And you can see that we had a period of considerable strike activism uh, back before the 2000s. And if I took this chart back further, you would see even more extraordinary days lost to strikes. We lost 24 million days uh, of work to strikes on average from 1947 to, 19, uh, 40, uh, to 1959. And then you can see labor became very, very quiescent for a whole variety of reasons. Uh, fewer union members, more aggressive actions by the, on the part of companies, and, and not that much inflation. But now lately, we've started to have uh, strikes pop back up. You did have a strike against General Motors in 2019. And of course, now everybody knows we have the screenwriters and the directors out on strike. And so you can layer the UAW on top of that, assuming it, it happens. And the strikes that have happened have been somewhat successful. It's hard to know exactly, of course, because inflation has also pushed up wages. But you can see that first year pay increases in union ratified contracts we're down as low as 1% or 2% in the early 2000s. We also did not have that much inflation. But now, partly as a combination of both factors, you can see that these contracts are settling out at between 5 and 6%. The problem here is that the union's demands are really pretty much extraordinary, way beyond what the car companies can meet and still have viable companies. And so the gulf between the two sides is very, very unusually large. And as we move to your next chart, Steve, we can see why auto workers are striking, which is effectively, as you say, their wages have remained basically stagnant for almost 30 years, not keeping in line with wage growth in the economy more broadly. Yeah, the auto sector is an unusual sector, not unique, but uh, manufacturing itself is different from a lot of the service kinds of jobs that have also got on strike, like the writers and the uh, L.A. hotel workers and so forth. But let's start with a couple of basic principles. The sort of deal between American business and American workers is if you produce more per person, we'll pay you more. And this, this close set of lines right here shows that happening. As productivity went up, going all the way back to 1960, wages went up in tandem. Workers were getting their share, in effect, of the pie. Starting in 2000, that began to diverge. Uh, uh, productivity continued to rise. But wages did not rise commensurately, and we had very, very high corporate profits. And there are a bunch of reasons for this decline in union membership, things like that. But the consequence of it was this, and the consequences were somewhat different for different parts of the labor force. If you were an auto worker, your wages, after adjusting for inflation, and stayed, stayed roughly flat throughout this entire period from 1990. So you had no real increase in your standard of living. Uh, all workers, which is this black line, had, had fairly you know, noticeable, not huge, but, but about a 10% increase in real wages over that period of time. And then you have manufacturing workers who were somewhere in between. They got some increases, but not as much as service workers, and, uh, but a bit better than the auto workers. So it's been a tough time for workers, particularly in manufacturing, to stay up 
uh, with inflation. And also, Mike Barnacle, the old world of auto workers being in unions has changed. If you move to the South and South Carolina and Georgia and places like that, you have a lot of non-union auto jobs there, and of course, those out of the country as well. So that's what auto workers in Detroit are up against. Here. There is all of that, Willie, in addition to a, a, a very feisty new head of the UAW, Sean Fain, a very aggressive union leader. And Steve, uh, the point that you raised earlier that there is a potential strike that will begin tonight at midnight, uh, maybe just one car company, we don't know yet. But what happens to the consumer who has ordered a 2024 model due out maybe in November or December? What happens to the cost of that car? Well, certainly wage increases are inflationary, and so you want to try to find some balance between the two. I'm not as worried about the inflationary consequences because labor is not actually that huge of a percentage of what it costs to make a car. It will be noticeable. I'm more worried about how this falls out in terms of the future of the industry because there are a bunch of disturbing trends that are unique to companies that export a lot, that live in a global market, and manufacturing companies, as opposed to service companies, a hotel worker, or something like that. Because let's take a look at what's been happening to the share of both car, car companies and to the workers who work, union workers who work at them. So the so-called big three, as we call them, uh, the Detroit Three, Chrysler, uh, which is now called Stellantis, Ford, and General Motors, was up at around 90%, if you go back into the 1960s, and these would have been virtually uh, a highly, highly percentage of union workers. And then that share has dropped, 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 and it's now down here at 40%. And that's a combination of imports from other countries as well as um, uh, companies uh, making cars here, uh, like Toyota, Honda, and so forth, and selling them into our market. The uh, union membership has dropped a pace. So union membership was as high as 60%. Over here, back in about 1980, and it's now dropped to about 10 percent, uh, under about 18 percent. Sorry, about uh, over here. And so the unions have lost a fair amount of their clout. A lot of these plants have moved to the south, where we don't, where they're typically not unionized, and they pay a lot less, and they produce a lot of the same cars, but outside of the unions. And so another place they move, we need to be cognizant of, is Mexico. So if you look at uh, uh, manufacturing employ auto manufacturing employment in Mexico, you can see that this red line right here has been going up and up and up. Obviously, COVID changed everything for a while anyway, and now it continues to go up to here. Uh, and, and whereas U.S. car manufacturing uh, employment has bounced around a little bit here, COVID, and now for the first time right around here, more Car, more uh, auto workers are working in Mexico making cars for our market principally than are working in the U.S. making cars. The people in Mexico can get paid as little as $8 an hour. Uh, there's one unionized GM plant that gets paid like nine, between $9 and $20, $33 a day. I'm sorry, it's a day, the $9. And so you're, you're competing, the union workers here are competing against uh, much more lowly paid workers uh, down in Mexico, and that's a further drag on auto employment up here. Great perspective on a strike that could be coming at 11.59 tonight. We'll keep our eyes open. Steve Ratner, thanks so much as always for walking us through all of it. And, and Sam Stein.